Greetings listeners, I'm Frank Howes from the Gold Coast of Australia. I will be presenting tonight with Matthew Metcalf from Elix. Matthew has asked me to present on selective laser trabecular plasty. The slides that follow will detail the process of applying this laser energy for the control of glaucoma. I have been working with selective laser trabecular plasty or SLT for nearly 25 years now. I did a whole lot of research on the subject while in the UK in approximately 1998 to 2005. This culminated in the production of the chapter in this text that you see. As all of you know, the treatment of glaucoma can be difficult, particularly when it comes to surgical intervention. Surgery for glaucoma can not infrequently have undesirable side effects. There has been a push worldwide to minimize the aggression of glaucoma surgery so that the side effects are less substantive. As also we all know, MIGS has presented itself strongly in our glaucoma management profile in an attempt to reduce side effect. Now, SLT indeed fits in the very epicenter of the definition of a MIGS procedure. If we look through these items, you will see that SLT fits into the epicenter of the bullseye of the various kinds of MIGS glaucoma treatments. So with that in mind, we should be very happy to know that a treatment like this works between 80 and 90% of the time. I'm going to go through the process of applying SLT through each one of these points to help describe how to apply this treatment most effectively. To make a start, we need to know the laser, the anatomy, the gonioscope, and the application routine. Over the decades, as you know, there has been much research and discussion on lowering the risk of intervention while maintaining procedural efficacy of reducing intraocular pressure. In 1979, Weiss and Witter described the IOP lowering efficacy of continuous wave argon laser applied to the TM. We did become aware over the next 10 years of the negative effects of this laser wavelength by the coagulative damage observed on the trabecular meshwork, as you can see on the slide. In 1995, Mark Latina and co-workers described SLT after work on a number of different laser delivery systems to avoid this coagulative damage. Here's an example of an electron micrograph showing the minimal damage after the application of SLT. This is a solid state frequency doubling neodymium YAG laser with a spot size of 400 microns. Q switched producing a very short pulse energy causing no coagulative damage and little structural damage to the human TM. I quote, the laser energy selectively targets the melanin-laden pigment cells of the TM. This tissue absorbs the energy inducing a macrophage cytokine response and cascade that has an IOP lowering effect. Hence the noted bilateral effect from our studies some years ago. Getting back to making SLT work, we need to know the anatomy. Seeing a simple diagram like this defies the complexity of managing to see the angle in difficult patients and difficult morphology and pigmented angles. Here is a schematic of a 400 micron spot in the angle versus the old 50 micron. This makes things a little bit easier for the users knowing that 400 microns spans the angle. 
Getting to know your gonioscope is helpful in learning the angle, making sure that you have a zero magnification gonioscope. In respect of the application routine, this is an important item to get correct because the application of the laser is invisible. The mathematics at the top of the slide show us that we need approximately 44 contiguous SLT shots to complete a hemisphere of application. Because the laser is invisible, we need to be structured on our application routine. The gonioscope is easy to use at 90 degrees, 180 degrees and 0 degrees. These landmarks make nice starting points for us to divide into eighths so that we can apply the laser superiorly from the inferior point, applying the first 11 shots, second 11 shots, then going to the horizontal midline and moving downwards to provide the third and fourth sets of 11 shots, totaling 44. Doing it was this way around, we are then likely not to overtreat or undertreat and avoid the complications or poor response of either under or over treatment. The next point is to choose the right patient, or better still, to avoid the wrong patient. SLT usually works in all forms of open angle glaucoma and ocular hypertension, whether treated or untreated. Our results showed good effect uh, in treating POAG and OHT on maximally tolerated medical therapy. It worked even better in the primary treated group, as you can see from the circled results. This is also mirrored by some studies done by Shlomo Melamed, showing also approximately a 30% mean reduction in trocular pressure. The response rates, as mentioned at the beginning of the talk, are between 80 and 90%, as shown on this set of graphs. For treated and untreated POAG and ocular hypertension. There is some variability in response in different patients and different glaucoma types. SLT will work on previous TRABs or stents that need supplementation. It works in any angle that is open or open by iridotomy, as long as the angle is not damaged by chronic angle closure or angle recession. It works best as a primary treatment as we know from the 2019 light trial done at Moorfields. SLT doesn't work if the angle is closed and it doesn't work well if stents are not working, presumably of course collective channel obstruction. Uh, it also doesn't work if there's been a previous non-response to SLT or a poor response to PGAs. Next, choose the correct laser settings. We have already spoken about the Q-switched exposure time and spot size. The energy requirement is titrated visually to be invisible. The energy range is usually between 0.4 to 1.3 millijoules, more pigmented, less energy, and vice versa. We need to titrate to cavitation bubble visibility, then stop back by 0.1 millijoule to no bubbles or minimal bubbles visible. We may need to adjust power in treatment occasionally if there is variability between pigmentation superiorly and inferiorly in that inferior quadrant. Hence the need for a repeatable application routine as described earlier. Next point is the application of laser energy with optimal fluence and positioning. 
experience in patient head position, gonioscope position, and tilt can all affect the fluence of laser energy. As the operator moves in rotation from position to position, attempt should be made to maintain the same angulation to maintain fluence constancy while delivering the laser spots in a contiguous manner. This needs to be as constant as possible, otherwise the energy endpoint needs to be reset as per pigmentary change. Now on to post laser management. Do not send patients home without a 45 minute post SLT pressure check. As can be seen from the adverse events graphing from our studies, a significant number of patients can have an IOP rise post SLT, particularly in heavily pigmented angles and in the presence of 360 delivered SLT. Hence the preference to stick to 180 degree treatments at a time. These pressure rises can occur from 30 minutes afterwards to three hours afterwards. Pre-treating with iopidine prevents this likelihood, making 45 minutes wait a worthwhile proposition and unlikely that an IOP rise would be missed. Pre-SLT explanations and consent are very important in this context. Next, do not send patients home on steroids. It is non-steroidals or nothing. We are attempting to generate a cytokine response in SLT and do not want this diminished. Non-steroidals are therefore the standard post-op, twice a day for five days. Steroids are counterproductive in this context aside the chance of inducing a steroid response. I preferably use no post-op if there's any issue with non-steroidals. Do not give up on success with SLT until three months after delivery. An 8% subset of our studies demonstrated a late response to SLT at three months. And finally, success of SLT may still be defined as a reduction in the total number of drugs required to reach target intraocular pressure. We also know that ocular surface disease or OSD and quality of life in our glaucoma patients are in inverse order. Indeed, the more glaucoma drugs our patients need, the more they suffer and less their compliance is likely to be. If therefore, with success from SLT, we are able to reduce the number of drugs our patients need to achieve target, we will improve quality of life as demonstrated by Skalicki and Goldberg in their publication in the AGO in 2012, and therefore improve patient compliance and glaucoma outcomes. Certainly with time and experience, the surgeon will learn what his best mode of application is, 180 or 360, whether he maintains a 45 minute wait, whether he treats with steroids, non-steroidals or nothing, but sticking to the basics as listed initially will allow the surgeon to gain the experience needed. Thanks for your attention.